this is really fun for me, a chance to introduce Dr. Chuck Stoner. Uh, I worked with him pretty much beginning 10 years ago, I'm guessing at that, and ongoing. So that's really fun. We have, we dazzled them in Chicago, Florida, uh, New Orleans. I could tell you several other places. Uh, but one thing that I, I really want to mention to you, Chuck is in Bauer language, is an artist. Uh, I tend to meet people, work with people, and I tend to decide whether or not I'm working with an artist or, again in my language, a mechanic. Okay? And there is nothing good about one and bad about the other. Uh, Mechanics are the people that get things done. Okay. The artists are the people who meet somebody like Jason Mott and they instantly have a feel for who he is, what kind of a person he is, his levels of integrity, humility. Uh, Chuck has been teaching long enough, and that's a big part of the story, but he's, he's an artist. And I don't designate too many people with that term, but he gets it. Uh, I would also mention to you that he is... Uh, 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 Ph.D. Professor Emeritus, retired, is that right? Close enough? <laughs> uh, he, uh, this is, this is, he's, he's received every award that the university has to give. I've been there and heard him speak at graduations. He's worked on uh, interviewing prospective deans for the Foster College, and kind of the big one, he has been integral to the interviewing of past and future presidents of the university. And that's, that's right up there, okay? Uh, he, uh, okay, he's written, Chuck, help me, I'm going to say 12 books, give or take, and, and he would, if he was up here, he would say, that's not including the coloring book, okay, uh, uh, He's an avid runner. Chuck, how many miles? 27,000 miles. 75,000 miles. 75,000 miles. <laughs> <laughs> He's run a lot of miles. Uh, oh, where is Alan? Alan, you know, let's you be part of this. You, you've been on vacation, Chuck Storm. Tell us something about yeah, no, don't. <laughs> about being on vacation with Chuck. Chuck is indeed a runner. The first trip we took together to the wilderness in north, northern Minnesota involved a 45-minute canoe trip followed by about a 35-minute hike. Um, and that was between the car and the cabin. Cabin remote, no electricity, no running water. 
to keep his running going, Chuck would take his hiking boots, put them on, and run that trail between the cabin and the lake with the canoe a couple of times a day. So he, he does run not just in Illinois, not just the Rock Island Trail. Pretty good. Pretty good. <laughs> If you come to hear him, not, not me, I, I would say this he is also a noted wine expert. Uh, oh, yeah, I thought we. Yeah. <laughs> um, Jeff Shelton, who was a member of our club for ages, was a noted wine connoisseur, the artist. Here. Not doing it with time and knowledge as well as assumption. But we're, we're very fortunate to have today the artist, Dr. Chuck Stone. Well, Tom, thank you. And um, some of the things Tom said were true. <laughs> but Tom, I, I hadn't planned this, but you took me back to fifth grade or sixth grade. And I know we've just gone through back to school time where the, where the parents come in and you know, get up, updated by the teachers on how the kids are progressing. The reason I mentioned this is that it was either fifth grade or sixth grade, my mom went to the meet the teacher. And the art teacher, her, Tom, I was the absolute worst student she'd ever had in her life. <laughs> And I was sort of proud of that. I mean, uh, so an artist, I, I'm not sure about. But Tom has been a friend and a colleague, and I really appreciate his value, Tom, and his friendship. And Alan Willison is one of my uh, my dearest friends. And um, mention the Boundary Waters. Here is the Eagle Scout, Alan Willison, taking the wilderness novice, me, to the Boundary Waters. And he would give me little cues in terms of what to do. And he was so kind. He would say things like, you know that fire is hot. <laughs> Chuck, I don't think it's a good idea to taunt the moose. Or my favorite one is we're in that lake for the first time. Chuck, the other end of the paddle goes in the water. <laughs> and he never got upset. We just went and did our thing. But Alan is a very dear friend. He has seen me at some of my highs. And uh, he is one of the few people that have seen me at my very lowest. And, He's been a friend through it all. We were having coffee at Panera not too long ago. I guess it was the summer. And he said, would you come and speak at Rotary? And since Alan asked me, the answer was yes. And I said, well, Alan, what do you want me to talk about? And he said, leadership 2021. And I thought, yeah, that's really good. You ask a leadership professor to come and talk about that topic. And I'm not going to talk about that. That's like a, a six-month seminar. So when you're back next week, I'll go through part two. And, um, so I when I thought about it, and I came up with themes. I thought, what's really resonating today? What's really important for us to talk about today? And the first one I thought about is how do we attract and how do we develop and how do we keep talent? Uh, it's really we're all facing that right now, and uh, not only how do we do that, but how do we get and how do we keep the best and the brightest so that we have a talent force that enables us to be competitive in a skilled environment? And I thought about that a lot. I realized it's newsworthy, but then I put it away. And I came up with a second one, Alan, and that was um, how do we create a workplace, a workplace that encourages and facilitates our people to be resilient given the demands of today's world? And I thought about that for quite a bit and, and how resiliency has become sort of a buzzword of our time. And uh, I put that one away too. They're not going to be gone for long, but I put it away. And what I came up with as my third theme is this one. And it's not a happy topic necessarily, but it's one I think that's critical and it's one I wanted to share with you at Rotary. I think we're facing today as leaders and organizations an amazing erosion of trust. An erosion of trust. Some would even say that we are facing a true crisis of trust in our organizations, and it's all organizations. 
Recently, the Gallup organization did one of their global database surveys and thousands of people participating and they asked this simple question. Do you believe you can trust the leadership of your organization? Jason, what do you think came out of that? Give me a number, give me a percentage. You either be right or wrong. If you're wrong, it's significant embarrassment. <laughs> if you're right, there's tremendous relief. <laughs> I mean, I'd probably say it's 50-50. 50-50, that's a pretty good number. Actually, most people would say that. This survey, which just came out, it was 30%. 30%. And by the way, most of that data was collected pre-pandemic. I've got to believe if it was done today, that number... I thought about that thing. And those three topics, how do we get talent and keep talent? How do we build resiliency in our workplace? How do we, as leaders, be sure that we're creating an environment of trust? Those are not independent topics. They're highly interrelated. And I want to talk about all of them together today. Heather, I'm going to tell a story that you have heard. If you give away the punchline, I will take away your umbrella. Okay. So here we go. I'm with my wife. And we're on vacation. And uh, she's a native Floridian. She took me to Key West, kind of an interesting place. And we're leaving Key West early in the morning to drive back to Peoria. The key is drive. That takes six months. <laughs> and uh, we're, we're in the car and we're driving along. We're on the Florida Turnpike. And it's just about lunchtime, just about this time. And, and uh, we're coming to the Fort Pierce Service Plaza. I'm giving you all of that detail because the Fort Pierce Service Plaza is the last service plaza before Disney World. Now, have you got this picture? Crowded turnpike, lunchtime, service plaza before Disney World, and I'm driving and my wife says, I'm kind of hungry, why don't we pull over and get something to eat? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for, for those, I, I, I felt the same way. And I said, honey, I don't think so. That's not a good idea. And without hesitation, she played another trump card. And she said, yes, she did say, I have to go to the bathroom. And it's hard to, to disagree with that or argue with that, so we stopped. And it was every bit as chaotic as I thought it was going to be. We fought our way through to the bathrooms. We came back, and I started out to the parking lot. And she says, well, now that we're here, aren't we going to eat? And, and I knew no wasn't going to be an answer, so we went into a Burger King. Uh, Jim Barrick, it's, it's not like Barrick's Cater Inn, but it was just a Burger King. And as I walk in, I, I've got to tell you, the line is one of those Disney World lines. There's 35,000 people between the door and the, the counter. And I'm grousing and complaining, which I'm quite good at. And um, I notice a couple things. The people behind the counter are smiling, they're friendly, they're upbeat. That's the first thing that struck me. And the second thing is, this line is moving. It's clicking along at a tremendous pace, and now the business side of me kind of sets in, right? And I'm thinking, what's going on here? There's a manager, a tall, thin woman, maybe 40, and she's everywhere, helping when she can and supporting her workforce. And I get up to the front of the counter, and I notice a young man at the end of the counter. His name is Bobby. He has Bobby on his shirt, you know. And uh, Bobby's job, and you know these people in big fast food restaurants, his job is to bark out the order number. 5,202, and that person comes up, gives Bobby the receipt, he checks the receipts against the contents of the bags, and when he's convinced everything is in sync, he rolls the bags up very carefully, hands it to the customer, and says, thank you, have a good day, and he says it the same way every time. I am married to a special educator, and I realize Bobby is a young man with some disabilities, I don't know what they are, but he's working this job. He's doing a good job. He's working it hard. And as all this is going on, and I'm, I'm coming up just about next, and, and the manager sort of brushes behind Bobby, this young man, this young man who's working so hard. And he turns around, he looks at the manager, and he says, I'm doing a really good job. <laughs> <laughs> and what happened next? She stopped. She stopped. She went over to Bobby. She took his two hands, she held his hands, and she looked in his eyes as if there was nobody else around, no one else in the restaurant. 
And she said, Bobby, you do a great job. You're part of our team. We couldn't do what we do every day without you. And she's gone. And the young man beats. Every time I tell that story, I'm kind of moved by the integrity and the authenticity of that manager. But I'm also moved by the things that she did. Number one, she stopped. Isn't it amazing? She had so many things going on. She recognized that this was a moment when she, she needed to stop. She gave him some affirmation. That's really important. But I think the third thing she did, she made him feel significant. Does that make sense to you? She made him feel significant. She made him feel valued. She made him feel important. Significant. I care. I make a difference. I have an impact. I would contend it's probably the strongest single motivator that any of us have. And I also know this. When people feel that they are significant, they want to stay in the organization. They want to work in the organization. They want to come to those kinds of organizations. Recent research also tells me that one of the keys to building resilience in our people is to have them feel that they're valued, important, and significant. A feeling of significance so important and so critical. I would challenge you, Rotarians, and I know you are all excellent leaders. I would contend that as leaders, we're building significance in our people every day, or we're missing the opportunity. And again, I think the outcomes of that significance are so critical. I'm in Scottsdale, Arizona, and uh, I'm asked by the American Association of Physician Leaders to come and speak to their annual conference. I had just written a book for them, and uh, I was promoting the book. I've got to tell you this. The conferences I go to from the College of Business, Best Western Hotels, the physicians don't stay at Best Western. I have never been at a place like this in Scottsdale. It's a resort. I walk in, I think I'm not worthy, and uh, but I stayed anyway. There was even a bottle of wine in my room for me. That didn't last long either. And um, so here I am, and I give my presentation. It's a room kind of like this, maybe a little bit bigger. Uh, probably had 150 people in there. They're all physicians. And um, good engagement, good back and forth. I come to the Q&A part, a couple questions. They were easy ones. The very last question. I'm almost home free. And the very last question is, is tossed at me. The guy starts out this way. He says, I'm the chief medical officer of my organization. I knew that that was to impress me. And I'm thinking, this is not going to be good. I could just tell by the tone. He said, you have talked now to us for nearly an hour. You've told us about all these ideas, all these psychological principles, all these critical concepts of physician leadership. And I'm thinking, golly, what's next? He says, of all of those things, which one is the most important? And I'm thinking, you know, it's kind of like asking you which of your kids you like the best. And said, what am I going to do with that? But, but I can't dodge it. And so I said to him, um, I think if I was really thinking about it, I would go back to um, probably go back to Rotary, and I would say, I think the most important thing you can do as a leader, other than significance, would be to build a work environment where people believe they're being treated equitably and fairly and justly. I said because when you have that climate where people believe there's equity and fairness and justice, you're going to have people staying. You're going to have people being motivated. You're going to have people who bounce back and are resilient. You're going to have many of the things that we're looking for, and you're likely to have a higher level of trust. And so he listened to that, and I said, well, look, let me go just a little bit further. I want to encourage you to think not only about justice within the organization, but a thing we call procedural justice. Yes, this was my attempt to be pedantic and impress him. It didn't. Um, and here's what that means. It means even when there are things happening in the organization that I don't like, that don't seem right, that don't seem fair, if the leadership can step up and explain to me why the decisions were made, the process that was gone through, the procedures that were used, I tend to still believe there's fairness and equity. At Bradley, as a department chair, I remember one year I petitioned my boss, the dean, for a salary bonus because he had a bonus holdout pool. 
I petitioned him for a salary bonus for one of my faculty members, who clearly had had the best year teaching, research, everything that he had done, the best year in the college. He deserved it. It was fair. It was just. It was equitable. And that dean came to my office, and he sat down with me, and he said, I looked at your petition, I looked at what you, you put in, and I'm not going to be able to grant your request. And I want you to know why. That why took me from a position of thinking this isn't fair to understanding his thinking, understanding his procedures, his processes. And uh, I also thought, if I was sitting in his chair, given what he just told me, I probably would make the same decision. That notion of procedural justice. Those themes, I think, are so basic and so simple, significance, equity, fairness, justice, and yet I think they touch those three earlier variables that I talked about. Tom is asked to speak at, from time to time at corporate dinners. Uh, I've been asked to do that a good bit too, and uh, I, that's really not a good gig to have. People have already eaten a lot, they've drunk a lot, and all they want to do is get back to the bar and there you are. My friend John Izzo does the same thing, and uh, he, he's based in Vancouver. And this is one of John's stories, and I, I want to use it as I sort of wrap up today. John was asked to speak to a, a corporate meeting, annual meeting. The company had about 2,000 people. And every year, the president and CEO would bring people together, maybe just have this gala. And one of his traditions during the gala is he would invite up to the stage the people who were retiring, as long as they'd been there 20 years. Anybody with more than 20 years, they'd be brought up to the stage. He would give them a gift, shake their hand, and say, do you want to say something to the audience? At which time, people would say no and return to their seats. And he goes through this procedure. And the very last person to be honored is Mary. He says, Mary, come on up. You've been with the company for 31 years. And Mary comes up and everybody, and everybody Mary was in information technology for those 31 years. And yeah, people, people clap. And he gives her the gift. And he says, Mary, do you want to say something? And she goes, yes. And people are kind of taken aback. The answer to this question is no. And she says, yes. <laughs> and so Mary goes to the microphone. And people are thinking, I didn't even know the woman could talk. And, and here she stands. She says, I don't know how many of you know this. But a few years ago, about six or seven years ago, I won the lottery. She says, it wasn't a big lottery. He says, I, I, I won a little over a million dollars. Sounds like a big lottery to me, but whatever. It wasn't the big lottery. I won a little over a million dollars. And she says, um, I, I just wanted you all to know that. And she said, but the reason I'm bringing it up is my boss, John, he's sitting right there in the second row. She said, uh, the day... I won, I was back at work, and he heard about it. And he comes up to me, and he shook my hand, and he said, you won the lottery. I I'm so happy for you. It couldn't happen to a nicer person. And I know you and your family have had some struggles, and this money is going to be, be so important to you. Congratulations. But I'm afraid you'll leave. I don't want you to leave. Our team's got some great things on the horizon, and you've got to be part of it. I'm just hoping you'll stay. And Mary said to the crowd, she says, I just wanted you all to know that. And she starts to walk away. She reaches in her pocket, and she pulls out this crumbled piece of paper, and she walks back to the microphone, and she says, by the way, this was my letter of resignation. You never know. You never know what impact significance and fairness and equity and justice are going to have. But I think as leaders today, we're called to address those issues, particularly given these, these factors, these, these erosions, these crises that I think are looming. As I end, thank you for letting me come back to Rotary. It's good to see Susie and hear from Susie. I saw Carol Halpern back there, didn't I? Uh, I look forward to saying hi to all of you after this. Thank you.